produced with GE as part of their breakthrough series on National Geographic, Nat Geo, Natty G's, uh, Natty, but a Geo thing. Right. Yeah. But before we get into it, you may be noticing three suspiciously respectable looking people <laughs> on stage with us. Let's meet our impressive guests. Up first is the Oscar winning screenwriter of A Beautiful Mind and many a post apocalyptic blockbuster uh, from I Am Legend and iRobot to the Transformer films. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Akiva Goldsman. First Academy Award winner to appear on our podcast. Must be a real honor for you. Po possibly, <laughs> possibly last. <laughs> Just pitching. Uh, our next guest is one of the insane mad scientists from Akiva's Breakthrough episode. Uh, he's helping turn the beer making process into a beer and clean energy making process. Please welcome Mr. Eric Fitch. <laughs> you, you prefer to go by Fitch, right? Yeah, people have been calling me that for a long time. Okay. I just go with it. I just want to make it clear up top that I'm not just randomly addressing you like I'm your middle-aged gym teacher, like calling <laughs> yo you. Fitch. Yo, Fitch. <laughs> hey, Incidentally, yo Fitch. also far too handsome to be a mad scientist and not be evil. So I'm already <laughs> suspicious of Fitch. <laughs> very true. Very true. And next to him, another one of these uh, suspiciously handsome mad scientists trying to save the world types. He helps shape GE's international water. Uh, policy helps the power and water division develop technology that will basically ensure that the world has clean water and renewable energy and doesn't have to resort to drinking our own pee like in that water world movie. Please welcome Mr. John Friedman. <laughs> is, that on your, is that on your vision board for like what you want to do on a daily basis? Just avoid drinking your own pee? I, I may Never not mind. have an Academy Award Akiva, but I am helping provide the world with clean water. Yeah. <laughs> and pee. <laughs> That's all you're going to say all night. Uh, that would be amazing. But I do want to start And out. pee! There it is. Uh, I do want to and the Academy out. Award goes to. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to talk about post-apocalyptic movies. Do you, do you feel like people are getting more interested in the apocalypse from like the time you started writing movies to today or is it just kind of been a steady oh i th i think i think a steady diet of armageddon is pretty yeah. much a staple um uh, I'm certainly more interested in the apocalypse every time I turn on the news and see donald trump but in in fairness um I, you know I, I think we have never had a shortage of uh, apocalyptic fantasy. Oh, well, that's incredibly comforting to me because as someone who grew up over time, if you're familiar, um, it's, it, did, it does seem to me that, or I've often feared that we have this special affinity for the apocalypse right now, and I worry about things that are like self-fulfilling prophecies, personally. So you, you believe that like if you think of a thing, it happens? Yeah, well, to some degree, which I think is why it's so great that things like Breakthrough are getting the word out there about, like, I think the first step to actually fighting climate change is, or at least a part of it is, people who are storytellers inculcating the youth, right? Like Captain Planet, to me, is why there's a green movement, for me. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so, uh, I do feel like there's this, you need to embed it in the consciousness, and by the same token, I worry, like, is everyone going to make I Am Legend happen? Because I really don't want to live that. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm actually not a fan of scaremongering, uh, you know, Jack. And I feel like it, I'm not a fan of drinking your own pee either, Akiva. <laughs> but I, I do feel like the solution to water scarcity does involve, in effect, drinking your own pee. You know, all of flip flopping left and right. <laughs> but, but if you look around the world, you know, we are seeing water scarcity in many places. You know, in Brazil, the taps are running dry. In Sao Paulo, here in California, we're in the fourth year of the worst drought in the past 500 years. And yet, there's a solution. So all this post-apocalyptic uh, uh, notion that uh, there's not water 
I don't think it is accurate because we can desalinate water as long as you have coastline or we can treat wastewater so it can be reused for agriculture, industry, and... Or drinking, well, don't dodge drinking. it, now that you've embraced it. Yeah. Well, when you, when you said it wasn't accurate, I was really hoping you would say, because I know where the water is. I know where we're keeping it, where it's hiding. Here's, right. how, I, here's how I look at, at, at desal, which is, uh, it's an... Ooh, desal. 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 Feel free to use that. But it's an incredible option to have if there's no other option. In other words, there's no such thing as absolute water scarcity as long as you have coastline because the technology exists to take seawater, strip out the H2O molecule, leave behind the salt, and everything else is bad. But the, uh, other, the other technology that I think you go to before desal is wastewater reuse because, again, the technology exists. I mentioned that earlier. But it costs half to a quarter as much as desal. And now there's this new technology which will allow you to treat wastewater for reuse while also extracting energy from the process. So much energy, you can actually add it back to the grid. We did mention Quantum of Solace. Did you get, like, in watching that, have you seen the yes. Bond movie about water? Was that a, like, hmm, experience or a... <laughs> mm -hmm. Right, well, I imagine you watching like, it like Neil deGrasse Tyson watches Gravity. Just being right. like, no, right. no, that's not, a, no, with the water. <laughs> right, nice try, Dominic Green. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so my company, we do that thing John was just talking about, where we take wastewater and we extract what energy is available from it, and we export that energy to the grid, and we treat the wastewater to a point that it's clean enough to reuse. One of the, op one of the opportunities that we've been working on is a brewery in Delaware called Dogfish Head, and beer is a neat um, thing to work with for a lot of good reasons, but <laughs> you might not know this, but for every barrel of beer you make, you can make three to five barrels of wastewater, and it's all from cleaning the process. There's a whole bunch of batch processes. You clean them out, and there's yeast and trube and hops and all kinds of grains and things, and it's nasty, and, it, and because it's nasty, it's hard to get rid of, and it's really, really rich in organic content. And what we figured out how to do is take that rich organic content and extract all the carbon and convert it into fuel. That way you can use the fuel and uh, it, it, you know, there's two values there. It's renewable fuel, but then you've got that water clean so you can reuse that water. How many beers in and getting did it people take drunk. to Sorry, put that together? <laughs> Was it on the eighth beer where you're like, wastewater, <laughs> oh my God. So are there other inefficiencies that like you kind of have your eye on? Like, okay, this is the next. There thing. are a lot of things. Think about any food and beverage manufacturing process, especially where there's liquids. Milk, if you're making ice cream or yogurt or even just plain milk, you might not know that everybody now is drinking whole milk and the, uh, the dairy guys have to throw away their skim milk. We take whole tanker loads of skim milk and process them through our facilities. Yeah, I think I heard that Greek yogurt like produces a waste product that is like... Yeah. Yeah, that's the a, thing that's that a, they melt the Terminator in at the end of T2. It's highly like, radioactive oh, somehow, yeah. That's, yeah. that's a huge one. The big difference between regular yogurt and Greek yogurt is a centrifuge. And you get Greek yogurt, you, you start off with regular yogurt, you put it through the centrifuge, you get Greek yogurt, which is thick and creamy, and then you get this other stuff called acid whey which is a really low pH lactose material. I thought the Greek yogurt process was one guy and one goat and a mountain. <laughs> I did not realize. The picture on the, on the tub. Did you do anything yeah. industrial at all. This is shocking. This also makes me feel like I'm gonna ask how eggs are made, and it's like, well, first you have a, uh, you make steel, and then the steel you break down. You put it in the centrifuge. Right. Yeah. We want to get back to some post-apocalyptic movies and why we watch them. That does seem like our comfort zone, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Well, yeah, Alex, you were pointing out an interesting point about kind of why we watch post-apocalyptic movies. And, like, it's sort of this idea that we're, like, doing it to get back to a state of nature, like, sort of be off yeah. the grid, in a sense. I mean, was that fantasy kind of at, in your mind when you were writing I Am Legend, like, the idea I of think that post-apocalyptic movies for the most part are about simplification, right? I, I think that when you're telling those stories, I mean, even though typically the context is elaborate in the way it destroys the world around you, the world is unbelievably simple. So I, I think they are kind of wish fulfillment. Um, and with that in mind, you can sort of take 
various tones. You can go as sort of stark as Walking Dead or as... I, 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 what's talking the, Dead. Uh, talking Dead. Uh, or you can sort of be last man on earth. You know, I mean, the truth is that um, it's really nice to know where the good guys and the bad guys are. It's really nice to know um, that if I do these things, today I will live, and if I don't, I will die. And what's amazing about the idea of post-apocalyptic is it really, it's sort of like saying science fiction. Do you know what I mean? It's not really one thing. It's a zillion things, right? So if you have Will Smith in the middle of a post-apocalyptic New York, you're gonna play wish fulfillment, mm -hmm. right? If you have um, Viggo Mortensen walking down the road, you're not. Um, but fundamentally, the grammar is still going to be the same, which is right. about survival. Are there movie apocalypse rules of thumb that like we don't know about? Yes, like, but I'm not at liberty to tell you. You're not at liberty. You. No. Like you can't no, they're, tell they're, us. They're, yeah. Wink if like you have to have bondage gear if it takes place in the desert. Or well, something. I, I think I think you know that. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's just that's clear <laughs> to that's everyone. That's kind of obvious. Yeah. Comparing, I think the Vincent Price Last Man on Earth, which bears some resemblance to I Am Legend. Uh, it's funny to me that two post-apocalyptic stories for the time in which they were written, one, the ultimate message, spoiler alert for like a 55-year-old movie, <laughs> but, uh, the message is like, you're the jerk and you didn't know, you're, an a you're the asshole and it's, everything's awful. And I think we've moved into a phase where it's much more wishful. And not to not you know, and not to diverge off into my own version of sure. geekdom, but we failed in our version of I Am Legend because we copped out at the end. Um, the truth is that narrative with Richard Ma which, which Richard Matheson wrote is about us being the bad guy. It has always been about in the Price version, in the Heston version, in our version as originally shot and still available on the worldwide. <laughs> um, you know, the original ending is we are the monster. Yeah. You know, and that was what Matheson was writing about. And then we sort of did that thing that everybody says happens in Hollywood, which in fact does, where we were like, oh God, what if humans are the bad guys? That will be bad. And we right. went and reshot an ending, you know? And, was that and based on testing? Like it just didn't test well and so you reshot? All those things are true. Wow. Yeah. That's and I crazy. think there's something wow. to be said for our times that like test audiences today don't want to see the downer post-apocalyptic. They would rather see Viggo Mortensen barely win than someone lose. No, you're, uh, I mean, yeah. fundamentally, our happy ending, Will sacrificed himself and died. Right. And in the actual, and the, more, the ending more consistent with the source material, he survived, but he realized that humans were obsolete. And people were much preferred the idea that he died, but humans <laughs> still had a place on the planet, than the opposite. You know? So literally, if a character is like revealing an ugly side of you, they're like, kill that guy! I don't <laughs> want him around! <laughs> All right, do we want to go around and give our uh, movie apocalypse that we're most hoping will actually happen? This and then is the one that I already talked, I'm scared about happen. jinxing us into the apocalypse. No, no, okay. no. So a depicted, one that has been depicted. Right. That yeah. we would like to happen. Right, yeah, or the one that seems like it would be the most fun. It, this is a very weird thing to say, but as basically an atheist, I would love if revelations happened. <laughs> Because I would, because I am humble and I would immediately be like, oh, I was wrong. Like I would out get on board real fast. And I'd just like a definitive answer to that whole issue. If I heard the trumpet of Gabriel, I'd be like, nope, fuck me then, all right. I was wrong. I like definitive things. Um, do you guys have any apocalypses you're rooting for? Or shall we move on? Yeah, on behalf of GE, could you please say which apocalypse? They're engineering. <laughs> I'd be happy to answer that question. Let me just say that GE is uh, not hoping for any particular <laughs> apocalypse. Very uh, bad for the we, we, we go with a portfolio <laughs> approach. <laughs> Whatever it is, I just hope it's not my fault. <laughs> I think all oncoming asteroid movies get people really stoked about the space program in a very good way. I think that's a very good... 
Like, you, you don't want it to hit, obviously, but it, it's like, it creates a lot of astronaut jobs for, like, astronaut-type people and construction workers. Yeah. Plus, I've always assumed in the Mad Max universe, everywhere but Australia has already recovered from the apocalypse. <laughs> so that'd be good, as long as I wasn't in Australia. You just get to watch Australia just yeah. be fucking crazy. It's in the same universe as 28 Days Later, where at the end of the movie, they're like, everything's fine, except Australia, don't tell them or go there. <laughs> But I, I do think we're, I think we're underestimating the value of the Stephen King apocalypse. Because in the Stephen King apocalypse, typically all hell breaks loose. But unlike in the Mad Max apocalypse, where I just die, right? They just look at me, then they go, what do we do with that Jew? Do you know what I mean? But in the Stephen King apocalypse, you get some, if you have any latent psychic ability, then it starts to rise, right? So in like The Stand or, you know, you suddenly get the sense that there's a world behind the world that's emerged and there's a whole other set of rules that's coming. So it's not just the sort of reductive, minimalized, minimized version of our world. It's sort of the window into the new world and then it ends so you don't know what happens. If you watch the program on energy, there's a woman there that's working on fusion and They've got $3.6 billion of your money invested in it. They're yeah. pretty close. If they get that to work, that changes the world forever. That's amazing. Can you explain how it changes the world? Like what, what would happen? Yeah, so th they're working at a, a way to supply an infinite, essentially infinite amount of energy with a small amount of water. Um, the sun has gravity and it pulls all of these uh, hydrogen atoms together and eventually they merge so you have fusion and you make a helium atom and when that happens you have a tremendous amount of energy that's released and you it's can imagine limited energy so. yeah well yeah. so that well not it's not unlimited so here, here's your apocalypse so eventually the, the helium <laughs> oh good the helium like squeezes together under the gravity and it becomes something else and it becomes something else and I think eventually you get to the point where you've made iron and everything turns to iron and then it's a becomes a red dwarf or something and that's, that's the end of... You do different things depending on the mass of the star, I think. Yeah, so that's, that's the end. When our, you know, w without the sun, obviously, we've got no Earth here. Um, so eventually the sun burns itself out through fusion. That sounds terrible. <laughs> I, I thought this was supposed to be something that was, you know, without bad side effects. But, you know, genuinely, I, I really feel like we have all the technology we need to to meet all of the world's water needs uh, today. And um, from the, the water story is very happy. And, and yep. just to defend fusion for a second, um, the, the trick for all these technologies is more energy out than in, right? Like that's, it's the simple math of that, which is if I get more out than I put in, uh, I'm, you know, I'm advantaged. And the trick with fusion is there's a tremendous amount of energy that goes in but if it gets it right, the amount that comes out is exponentially larger and it's self-sustaining. So that it really would solve all the energy problems of the world. It just, nobody's quite got it right yet. Thank you guys uh, for coming out. <laughs> Akiva, Fitch, and John, and Michael and Alex, and we'll be out, out front later on. Thank, Thank you, Jesus. So